And hello! Back to the ZBrush Summit. So I am your host, Paul Gabri. The ball to go take a, a quick run, and so you guys get me for a little bit here on stage in my full glory. I'll do a little spin for you guys. There you go. So I want to thank you guys for watching and tuning in to the event here. And we, right now, uh, about ready to present is one of my good friends, Michael Clymer. So me and Clymer, little known fact, we did work together for a little bit. And Clymer is one of the few people that every time I did something, he'd outdo me with something else. So I'd model something, and he'd come back and be like, hey, look at this. I modeled the seam lines on this. And so we would constantly go back to force on this with this battle of trying to get the most detail into everything. And so Climber's going to show you some great stuff here today, and his video game has sucked away quite a bit of time for me. I've been running around in the virtual world of Destiny 2, so I'm really excited about what he's about to show you guys. So take it away. How are you guys doing this evening, or afternoon, whatever it is right now? Um, uh, as Joe said, my name is Mike Clymer. Uh, I am a senior artist for the hard surface team at Bungie. I've been there for about a year and a half now. Uh, and the whole time that I've been there, we've been making a little project that you might have heard of, uh, Destiny 2, um, a game that one of these days I actually hope I have time to play uh, as soon as <laughs> this is all said and done. Um, so there you go, Destiny 2. That's Sadly, I made none of this, right? <laughs> Up on screen, I made no part of that. Nothing to do with this. Um, but I did actually pay, uh, play a, a pretty decent-sized role in some of the weapons. Uh, when I came onto the studio uh, and to the project, uh, Destiny 2 had been in development for some time already, so there was quite a bit of assets that had already been made. Uh, so about a year and a half into the, my time there, I've been able to crank out maybe 15 or 20 different assets for the game. Um, so I'm actually going to start the presentation by talking about stuff that's not mine. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the, the teammate work that has been done um, by the other fine artists on my team um, who do use Z ZBrush. Uh, we have, it's a decent sized team uh, as far as number of people go, but as far as weapons and asset creation and ships and vehicles. It's a relatively large team, considering we have, I believe, 10 people right now total that, that do all this stuff. Uh, and at the moment, there are three of us that are, are pretty heavy ZBrush users. And then the rest of us, or the rest of them, use uh, another uh, 3D software application that I'm not going to name because it shames me. Um, <laughs> I, I'm slowly trying to convert them over. I feel like a, a you know, traveling salesman going door to door, you know, have you, have you met the, uh, the powerful savior of ZBrush? Um, so uh, this, this piece was actually done by one of our artists named Lee Hines. Uh, it's a shotgun from the Trials of the Nine weapon set. Uh, this was just released not too long ago. Um, I believe the 22nd of last month, uh, the Trials went live. Um, it's a shotgun that I will never get. Uh, I'm absolutely terrible at PvP, so uh, they won't give this to me for free, so I just get to look at pretty pictures of it. Um, this is a, a key shot render that Lee put together for me uh, of the shotgun. Um, and here's another view of it at a key shot. Uh, some basic material breakdown on it, uh, and then all the rest of it is actual geometric model detail. Um, Lee has a, a, a sort of different approach to uh, modeling in ZBrush than I do, uh, although I used to do very similar. Last time I was here in 2014, I was presenting for another little game that you might have heard of called The Division. Um, and we had done the weapons on that one. And at the time, we were, the team was just starting to get into ZBrush as far as hard surface modeling and, and hard surface techniques go. So we were pretty rudimentary uh, at the time, sort of brute forcing it. And don't get me wrong, I still abuse ZBrush like you wouldn't believe. But um, you know, the, the process is sort of refined a little bit over time. But the way Lee does things is, is similar to the way we used to do things back then. Um, he will model the bulk of the weapon out in Maya, or 3D Studio Max in his case. Um, and we'll use uh, negative shapes, Boolean shapes, in order to kick over to ZBrush using Gozi or, or exporting as an OBJ. 
subtract those meshes out, do some testing and some iteration on it to make sure that, that it's looking the way he wants it to, and then go back to Max, model a few more parts, send them back over, dynamesh them out, and then uh, sort of subtractively work on the model as he goes. But he still uses uh, Max quite a bit for, for that sort of stuff. Um, although as we get more and more comfortable with it, it's more and more actual uh, modeling in ZBrush. Now that we have ZModeler, we can do a lot of, of that basic primitive modeling for the, the cutting and the shapes. Uh, directly in ZBrush itself. Um, so long story short, there's a lot of different ways that you can go about doing hard surface in ZBrush, um, and this is just the way that Lee happens to approach things. Um, so uh, he's only been on the project for a little while, and, and most of the stuff that he's done uh, and that I have done and the rest of the team have done recently, um, we can't talk about just yet. So uh, there's, there's more content to come, but this is just what I, I am able to show right now. Um, the next thing that I'm going to show you is uh, a gun called Sunshot. <laughs> um, it's an absolutely fantastic gun. The, the design team at the studio did a fantastic job putting, down, putting the perks together. The visual effects guys, the animation guys, they all did a great job putting this thing together. It looks really awesome in the game. Um, but this is the, the high poly model of it out of Keyshot again. This is from Joshua Morrison, uh, one of our other artists on the team. This was actually the first gun that he did when he got to Bungie. Um, he joined the team from Jaeger over in Germany, had been working on a, a game over there, uh, joined us on the team. We gave him like a week to learn some documentation and some read over some stuff, and then we just threw him straight to the wolves. And here's, here's an exotic weapon, uh, get going. Um, but his modeling technique is a little bit different than Lee's in that he, he does more of his stuff in ZBrush proper. So. Uh, more of the base modeling, the shapes, smoothing things out, um, using the Dynamesh and the Boolean operations with primitives to, to sort of cut everything out and doing all that in, in uh, ZBrush itself. Uh, the one thing that you may notice from this is that all of the uh, ornate line work and or engraving that's on the game model is missing on this piece. Um, and to kind of fall back on what I was talking about a second ago, each, each person has kind of a different way of going about their, their creation process. Uh, in this case, uh, Josh wanted to go and do all that line work in um, Substance Painter, um, not necessarily because it, it couldn't be done or it was less efficient to do it in ZBrush than it was in Substance, um, but just because of the limitation of the, the way the design was rolling out, it was... Um, in his case, he felt it would be easier to do the line work in, in another application. So it's missing on this one, um, but it was all done in a separate application. I'm actually going to cover a little bit of that later on uh, as far as doing some, some fine line work and edge work, um, knowing that there's a very high possibility that someone somewhere will come in and say, hey, I like that, but change it, um, which is something that we always get to deal with. Um, so I'll cover a little bit of that later on. Uh, let's see here, what else do we got? Um, this is a little bit of a different piece. This is a tank that was done by one of our artists named Chelsea Velasquez. Um, her method is a little bit, at least on this piece, was a little bit more similar to the way Lee did things on that trial shotgun. Uh, a lot of it was built out in uh, 3D Studio Max. And then once the base forms and the shapes were done, uh, sent over to ZBrush, and she spent uh, a good amount of time going in there and detailing it out. So uh, using insert multi-mesh brushes to place all of her rivets down the body lines, uh, doing all the gears and the springs and, and the small detail work. Um, but you can see that she was able to get a whole lot of detail uh, cranked into this thing. Um, I mean, even down to, if you look down here, oh, no, nope, not that way. Uh, on the bottom of the, the dozer blade, she was able to put, you know, fine scratches from where it would dig things up and stuff. Um, so this was one of hers. And then we had two variants of this thing. We had the, the loader tank, which was the um, non-weaponized, non-mechanized, or not non-weaponized version of this thing. Uh, and then we had this guy here, which is a player tank that during a, a mission in the game, you actually get to hop into it and blow some stuff up. So, um, you know, the great thing about using ZBrush like this is if you want to make a variant of something, it's really easy to duplicate the subtool, start chopping some parts out of it, um, pop a gun on top of it, and now you have a, a new variant that you can work with. Um, and you can see two things, like uh, she added 
um, on the, the side here, uh, back behind the tank, she was able to add some saddlebags and some smoke grenade canisters and things like that, just to sort of break it up and, and make it look like a completely unique vehicle. It took off the loader at the very bottom. Um, but this one was uh, also done in ZBrush. All the detail work and everything was done in ZBrush, uh, different decal passes and things like that. Uh, this is another one of her pieces. Um, this is a new foundry that was just added to Destiny 2 called Viced. Um, and it's sort of a anime-inspired science, sci-fi weapon foundry. Um, but in this one, she actually went through and did a completely different workflow on it. Uh, she wanted to push herself a little bit further and get, a, a get more away from the traditional box modeling in Max and then move more into the ZBrush side of things. So this one was done almost exclusively in ZBrush. Um, there are still some things that we have to do with the game in Max. Uh, all of our tools and everything are, are interfaced through 3D Studio Max and Maya, so we still have to go back to, to those programs for that. Um, and then we have to get an early iteration of the, the weapon, the vehicle, in the game uh, soon on before we, be, we do all the detail work. So we need to go all that in Max as well, and I'll cover a little bit of that later on. But you can see all the different panel lines and the line work that she did for it. Um, and in this case, you can see that there's some plastic grain that was uh, done on the surface. I believe that was actually all done uh, in Keyshot with materials. Um, but like Joe, Joe mentioned earlier, um, I'm sort of obsessive with my detail. I'll actually go in there and I'll model plastic grain into a surface in the mold lines, and I'll show you some of that stuff later on. Um, and then more detail. So one of the things that we do uh, in general is we spend a lot of time thinking about how the weapons will look in uh, first person or ADS view, uh, aim down sights view. Um, because it's a first person shooter, that's where a lot of players spend their time, so we'll put a lot of, a lot of effort and emphasis into this view in particular. Uh, and we actually have a crazy talented uh, scope UI artist by the name of Jesse Hall who, who does 95% of our scopes for the game. Um, and really make some usable and functional and all the sort of subtle stuff that everybody hates about scopes, he thinks about, and it drives everybody on the team nuts, but he's amazing at what he does. Um, but this is, this is a high poly version of that scope UI and the, the weapon layout. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how it actually looks and funnels in the game and the first person perspective and all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, those are, those are the three people on the team that actually use ZBrush aside from myself. Um, like I said, I'm slowly trying to convert everybody to use it, but it's, it's an uphill battle. Um, so we'll go ahead and close these guys out. And then uh, now I'm actually going to show you some of the ZBrush content that I did for, for Destiny 2. Um, Bungie was nice enough to allow me to bring some ZBrush files with me. Uh, and this is all stuff that I haven't shown before. Um, so this will all be new content for everybody to see. So I hope you enjoy it at least a little bit. Okay. So, this is a grenade launcher. It's an exotic grenade launcher from Destiny 2 called the Prospector. Uh, it is from the Tex Mechanica uh, line of weapons. So, it's got a very Old West, um, you know, cowboy sort of feel to it. Uh, so, a little bit blockier in some areas, a little bit more elegant in others. Um, and if you actually go back, let me, I'll start with this here before I get into the ZBrush model. Uh, this was the original concept for it. Um, this one is a basic 3D model that has been uh, painted over in Photoshop. Um, but you can see that it sort of blocks everything out for us. It's got the general hits on all this sort of stuff. We've got a soft organic grip up here. We've got round barrels with ornate filigree. We've got some uh, high frequency, high detail engraving throughout here. Uh, and the concept artists will actually go all the way down and think about things as far as, you know, what kind of screws go onto a surface. Is it, in a case like this, it's a Tex Mechanica, so it's, it's supposed to have that Old West vibe and feel to it. So, uh, you know, putting some crazy uh, three-pin locking hex screw on it really doesn't make any sense, but putting a flathead screw on it feels more appropriate to it. So we'll think about little things as far as the details go and uh, you know, try to make them feel like they, they belong in that universe, uh, especially if they're foundry specific. Um, 
So we can see a side view of this thing. Here's another one of those examples of thinking about how it looks in first person versus how it looks in aim down sights. Um, and you can see that the concepts themselves are, are just loose gestures of, of how we should go about doing things. Uh, and one of the greatest things about working there is that we have so many different talented uh, concept guys that they all work in slightly different ways. Um, uh, some of them, like Sung, who worked on this piece, will um, they will do low poly models and then texture overlays and things like that. We have other artists that will do uh, really loose models with with more texturing over top of it, and then we have some that will go you know all out and do full models, ZBrush models and stuff like that that will uh, get passed along to us. So it's uh, it's definitely a, a constant challenge of how we do that, uh, and then. Uh, rough idea of how we're going to animate this thing as far as the reload and things like that go. Um, and you can see that they'll go through and they'll, they'll put like uh, little watch details and, and they put some finer detail in there as far as the details go and things like that. And then this will get passed off to the artists and then we'll go through and then start flushing this out into to physical model. Uh, sometimes, like in this case, we did have a basic 3D model to start with, um, usually pretty rough. Uh, especially in this case, because it's not really meant for anything aside from doing texture paintovers on. Uh, but we'll take that model, take it into 3D Studio Max, and then uh, use, use um, we have a specific rig, skeleton rig, that we have to work within. Um, so most of the weapons of any different faction, or not faction, but uh, type of weapon, the assault rifles, the pulse rifles, the scout rifles, they all have their own animation sets that they work off of, so the hands go in specific places, certain parts move, magazines always go in certain places. So we have some constraints that we have to work within. So the first thing that we'll do when we get these things is go in there, move some stuff around, move the major forms around uh, while they're still super low and block out in order to get them lined up, get the hands in the right positions. Um, We'll take those really low poly block models and then kick those over to the engine, hook everything up, make sure that the hands go in the right spot, everything's wide enough, um, gives them enough room, you're not getting major clipping and things like that. And then once we have those block models uh, flushed out, and those can be anywhere between you know, five and six hundred polygons for a super loose shape, all the way up to you know, 30 or 40,000, depends on the kind of model that we get from the concept artist. But we'll take all those models um, flush them out, get them to the point where the proportions are correct, the scale is physically correct, uh, and then we'll take those over to ZBrush and start uh, dividing those up and, and cleaning those up. And since we already have the basic forms there, you can go in there and either divide up the existing shape to add detail to it, or you can use ZModeler to build more elaborate and more complicated shapes around the ones that are existing. So. I'm just going to go through a couple of the small parts on this guy here and give you a, a sort of idea of the level of detail that we try to go through. Um, and I'm going to cover some of this stuff later on as well uh, as far as techniques and stuff go, so don't worry about that. Um, I mean, this is just the, the site itself. It's pretty basic filigree pattern. Um, there's nothing really crazy going on with it. The shapes themselves are pretty simplistic, but this was all done um, taken from that original block model and then rebuilt in ZBrush. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, some of the stuff as far as like how we get like the bevels, um, the, the big even chamfers around the edges and things like that. Um, there's some, some interesting ways that you can go about doing that stuff. Um, but, and then we'll go down to the next piece here. And there's, there's really nothing uh, too insane about these things. The, the details themselves are more repetitious and more repeating patterns. It's just a matter of stacking layers one on top of another. And then try to build everything out. Um, for the most part, we know how the animations and the rigs and all these different things are going to work on this stuff, so we kind of know where the detail has to be and where the detail doesn't really need to be. Um, but one of the uh, curses and blessings of Destiny weapons is we like to do variations on things. Um, 
Sometimes on exotics, where we'll do a new texture skin or something like that, but uh, usually on some of the lower level weapons, we'll do uh, different versions of uh, cowlings and covers, we'll do different grips, we'll add lights and lasers and things like that. So we do have to make some of these things pretty modular. So you'll see in here that if I scroll down my subtool list, there's basically subtools for every single part. Um, I mean, each grenade is broken out into its own subtool. The sights are their own subtool. Um, and the layers are named. For the love of God, <laughs> name your layers. It makes life so much easier, especially if you're not the only one working on this file. Um, nobody really likes to go in there and try to track down PolyMesh 36573D or recovery tool. Um, so uh, yeah, go in there and keep things organized and, and name things up. But breaking things apart into multiple layers and multiple uh, subtools will really help uh, when it comes later on to doing these modular variants and, and customizing things. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and turn everything back on here. The system seems to be handling all this pretty well. Um, and then I, I, when I was talking about Chelsea's uh, Vice grenade, or not uh, grenade launcher, SMG, um, I was mentioning that the plastic grain that was in there, I'm, I'm pretty positive, was done in, in um, uh, Keyshot. Um, but this is the sort of thing that, that I like doing. Not necessarily, whoops. Not necessarily because I need to, but because I'm silly. Um, but I'll go in there and I'll put like the plastic grain. And uh, Drust mentioned the mold lines. I'll go ahead and put those in there as well. Um, there, I really don't have a reason for it. It's just foolish. Uh, but it makes me feel better about the models. Um, and then, uh, so this is actually kind of a fun one. Well, not fun, but, you know, silly. Um, when I work on stuff, I like to think of things as far as machining operations go. Um, I don't have an engineering background, but I tend to think about things in sort of an engineering way. You know, if I was going to make this thing for real, how would I do it? Um, would I start with a single block of metal and then mill things out of it? Is it a piece of plastic that's injection molded? Um, is it a complicated part that's going to have multiple molds and forms? Like, is it a five-part mold that's going to have, you know, crazy panel lines and seam lines that go around it where the, the mold lines go together? Uh, where are the injection molding points? That sort of thing. Um, but with the machining operations and stuff, if you ever take a look at real weapons, there's usually uh, flat spots machines on the rails. And if you look at the underside of the rail, there's, there's like a little, it's almost microscopic, but like there's a little notch that, that is in there from part of that machining operation. And it's kind of standardized across all of them uh, with the military stuff. So I'll, even, I'll go in there and I'll put that sort of thing uh, along the bottom. And it, it, it doesn't really do anything, um, but I think, at least in my head, I could be completely wrong, but to me it helps um, anchor these things in realism. Um, anybody can take 50 different parts of a machine or a robot, stick them together, dynamesh it into something, and then call it a sci-fi weapon. But as soon as you start to look at it and break it down, you know, how does that thing work, right? Where, when you fire this thing, is it energy or is it projectile based? Uh, if it's energy, where does the power come from? Is it a crystal? Is there a, a battery cell in it somewhere? If there is, how does that energy get from point A to point B? Um, if it's a projectile, how does the bullet go from the magazine into the gun? Um, it ships, sparrows, you know, all the sort of stuff that we work on, we try to ground all that stuff in some sort of realism. Um, our sparrows are based very much on uh, sport bikes. So a lot of the mechanics of the arms and, and that sort of stuff are based on sport bikes and sport airplanes and things like that. So looking at the, the realistic stuff and then not reproducing that, but using that as an anchor to, to put your stuff uh, in that realistic realm is, it's, it's helpful. It makes it feel like it is a real thing, even if it's not. So, I'll go through some of these different parts here. Uh, and it just dawned on me that I have the wrong screws on the stock. 
I put Phillips head screws back there instead of flat head screws. I'm a terrible person. Um, this was actually a fun piece to work on. Um, this is one of those ones that if you had tried to model that in, in another traditional 3D modeling application, you probably would have lost your marbles. Um, but this one was all done uh, basically with stretch and pull and move and clip and H polish and um, alphas for the, the checkering patterns up there. Um, and then uh, like a, a deformer for this little curved tail down here. Um, not really a lot of people know about this thing. Oh, let's see here. Come on. There we go. Um, so if you are using transpose, and I'm still like using the transpose line, so don't hold that against me. Um, I'm, I'm slowly adapting to the gizmo, but I love this thing. Um, if you've got a transpose line drawn out and you want to give something sort of like an antenna bend or a whip bend, uh, if you hover over uh, the red circle right here and you hold down Alt, you can get like this sort of nice uh, soft lattice deformation uh, through the length of it. So you can use that to sort of bend things and, and give whips and stuff. Uh, and then the same thing on this, this middle circle here. If you hold down Alt on it, you can get sort of this squishy deformation in there. So you can, you can get some kind of organic shapes with this thing. Um, and this one's pretty obvious, but uh, I shouldn't say that. Uh, not everybody knows it. But uh, on the, the opposite end with uh, the YZ transform, clicking on that thing will give you that dynamic clipping operation. This, that's one of my bread and butter tricks. I use that for everything. I, I clip and flatten surfaces with that thing uh, almost as much as I use the clip brush and stuff. Um, but anyway, uh, back to this thing. You know, using the H polish to sort of get in there and clean up those shapes, and then pinch to run around the edges and clean it all up. Um, so yeah, that was that was a fun one to work on. Uh, and then I use alphas and stuff too. Uh, I made a little bull logo uh, for the skull emblem in there, and for the Tex Mechanica TM logos over here. Um, stuff like that I usually save until the very end. You know, a lot of the character guys will get up here and they'll talk about getting the major forms and flushing that out first before they get in there and add all the crazy detail as far as the muscles and pores and wrinkles and stuff. Uh, for hard surface, I really do the same thing. Um, because there's always that chance. I mean, we, we, we take it into the engine early on and make sure that everything works uh, as far as the animation goes and the positioning and all that stuff. But there's always a chance that um, art direction or a lead or somebody on the design team will come in and say, hey, this is great, but the gun is too wide and it blocks the field of view in first person. Or everything works really well except the flow of this line and we need to go in there and modify the angles in order to even that thing out with the rest of the angles in the gun. Uh, so we're, we're super picky about not just the final result, but breaking it down in the modeling process all the way through, you know. We'll get a piece, and I think some of the concepts that I brought with me will show that, but um, they'll have like angled slashes that are sort of a repeating form throughout the shape. Um, and it could be anything to, to, as a panel separation that separates one piece of plastic from another, or the end of a plastic cowling, um, or just a detail for a vent. But, um, you know, if we get those things and each of the angles that runs back through the, the length of the gun aren't the same angle, if they're not all 22 and a half degrees cut back, we'll go in there and we'll modify them to make them all the same because uh, nothing really bugs me more anyway than looking at something and having like weird angles cutting through it unless the idea is to make the gun's detail, like to make it feel uncomfortable for some reason, like you're looking at it and there's that tension or the friction that you feel. Um, unless you're going for that specifically, you know, making sure that everything is nice and symmetrical and clean helps out a lot. Um, but we'll, we'll intentionally not add the micro details into the surface until after everything is perfectly flushed out and signed off on, um, just for those reasons, for, for the potential changes. And uh, one of the things that I'm gonna cover on this guy here in particular, um, oh, actually before I do that, this is one, people think this, I'm just insane for this. Um, but I'll actually put the rifling inside of barrels, like all the way down the length of the thing, and then making sure that you can see the grenade at the end of it. 
Um, it's more for this sort of thing than anything else, not necessarily for all weapons, because the smaller the gun, the smaller the barrel gets, but for these big things where you can actually physically see down it, I, you know, I think it's a nice touch to be able to see the rifle spiral down there and all that sort of stuff. Um, but anyway, I digress. Um, but so, okay, let's talk about this filigree for a little bit here. Um, what are the chances do you figure that the first time you do an ornate filigree pattern like this, every art director and lead that comes by to take a look at it is gonna say, that's perfect, you got it on the first try. <laughs> Does anybody think that's gonna happen? Because it, it doesn't. Um, so I got, I got lucky on this one. I only had to do it three times. Um, so going into this, and, and I should mention that this was the first weapon that I did for Destiny 2. Like I, this was my deep water, throw me into the deep end of the pool sort of project when I got there. Um, so I knew going in that the chances of making changes after the fact were pretty high. Um, at my previous gig working on the, the weapons for the division, um, Right, if you're making an M16 or a rocket launcher that's based on a real thing, there's really no artistic arguing that it's right or wrong. It's based on realism, so if it is the thing, it's right. You know, and outside of the details as far as texturing and things like that go. Um, but in a case like this, because it's fictionalized, it's based on concept and there's artistic taste that goes into it, uh, the likelihood of having to go in there and make these small changes, or in this case, fairly substantial change, is pretty high, right? So you want to kind of cover your bases. Um, the guys from Gorilla showed this last night, and, and they're, I, thought I, had, I thought I was doing pretty good with like two layers. They have like 13. They're, you guys are nuts. Um, but layers are really good for stuff like this. You know, if you're working on a piece of plastic and you want to put plastic grain on it, um, throw that on a layer, because as soon as you go in there and start stretching stuff, that plastic grain is going to get all distorted. So um, if we go in there and just turn this stuff off, you know, it goes back to its, its base form, right? So you can really easily go in there and, and add a different filigree pattern. Um, and you can go through and add, um, if, if you model it to go in and you want it to go out for some reason, or other way around in this case. Um, you know, it's just as simple as sliding that to a negative scale, and now your filigree pattern gets carved into a surface instead of out of the surface. Uh, if you do a hex pattern on the grip of something or, or a grain of plastic or, or anything like that, and you want to change up the way it looks, being able to just slide those layers around makes life way, way easier. Uh, and then breaking things up as well, right? So I have two different layers in here. Um, and the first layer is obviously for this front half of the, the grenade launcher, while this second uh, section back here is for these you know, smaller details on the top and the bottom. So if I wanted to make those, um, well, no, I don't want to record, uh, but if I wanted to make those less intense or take them off entirely or make them more subtle, you can do things like that. Um, the nice thing about the layers too is if, you know, let's say, let's put this first one back at, one, um, if for some reason you sculpted that thing and it wasn't strong enough of a detail, you could just as easily come down here, duplicate that, and now it's twice as strong, and now even more and more and more. And so you can keep adding more and more depth to it, and you can keep layering things on top of each other, um, which is you know, incredibly handy for the sort of micro information that can be turned off and on uh, at will. So. Um, because I knew there was a possibility of this changing, putting that stuff on a layer um, saved my butt. I mean, there, was, there would have been no way that I could have done anything with this high poly after they came back and they said, hey, look, your first pass is too ornate or it's too flowery. Make it more viney. Um, I'd, I'd had, have basically had to start over in a lot of different cases or roll back to an old file. Um, so trying to think about the possibility of making those changes in the future is, is going to be a good thing. Uh, let's see here. Um, yeah, and then after, after we get to the point where we're, we're happy with the model, art direction has signed off on it, everybody's content with the high poly, 
Um, I'll actually go through and decimate the model. Um, I'll go through piece by piece and sort of decimate each one individually and then merge them all together. This is actually a trick that I learned from Joseph. Um, we'll take it all, merge it together as a single subtool and then stack that at the very top of the scene. That way when I save things into my directories in Lightbox, um, or not Lightbox, um, that Lightbox thing. is correct. You got Lightbox it. is correct. Hey, I got it right. Um, I'll save them into a directory up there for grenade launcher, gun, whatever it happens to be. Uh, it'll show you a little complete icon of the weapon when you're in there, so you're not just looking at a small screw or a grip or a barrel. Like, you don't know what it is. You have to read the name, so you can just look at a little picture. Um, so I'll collapse everything down, throw that as the so top subtool, um, and then use that as, as my icon in Lightbox. Uh, the other thing that I'll do, too, is our, our engine for Destiny is pretty robust as far as how many polygons it can push. Um, so just because I like to abuse software, I'll actually take that model. In this case, it's only 9 million points. Um, and then I'll decimate it even further. I'll try to get it down to below a million points, but I'll actually send that decimated high poly to the game with the animation in the rig to get it into the character's hands to actually see it fully flushed out before I go through and do all the texturing and the material work and everything on it. Um, and if there's any last minute changes, then it's being done back on the high poly again as opposed to taking it down to low poly, going through the entire process and then going backwards again. Um, so I'll try to get it to less than about a million and do it that way. Um, yeah, and then from there it's, it's low poly time, UVs, unwraps, uh, substance designer to do our materials on textures on everything and then off to the next one. Um, so that being said, let's go to the next ones. Um, this is one that, uh, th this concept was done by, um, oh God, I've completely blanked on names, Patrick Bloom, um, one of our concept artists at the team. So he worked on this concept here. Uh, it's for the new uh, PVE set for Destiny 2. Um, it's sort of the, it's a good way to put this, it's sort of the base layer of gun throughout the game. I mean, there's, there's low level versions of it all the way up to high level versions of it, but it's kind of the stripped down iPod, iPad of the universe. It's sort of streamlined and sleek. There's not a lot of graphical detail to it. There's a lot of open canvas to it um, that we can then later use for decals and stickers and color variations and camo patterns and things like that. Um, so this is a concept, uh, the Patrick's concept for it. This was a, a really low block model that was then painted over top of. Um, come on, there we go. And you can see here uh, some different views of it. Uh, on the left, you're going to see what it looks like during the firing sequence. You know, this is what it looks like when it recoils up on you. And then on the right, um, you're going to see the gun as it looks in first person. And the different guys will do different ways, but they'll put like different call outs on things. You know, uh, green light indicates the full ammo capacity. Uh, the drum, you know, over here you can see that there's like a little LED illuminator on there that will display whether or not it's got rounds left in the gun. So we, we'll have both the HUD and the UI in the bottom corner of the screen that'll tell you how many rounds of ammo you have, but we also try to put things like that on the weapons themselves. So we'll, we'll plan out these little sections ahead of time so we can save space for those in the, the high poly and in the texturing side of things. And then same thing. Um, you know, what happens when you run out of ammunition. You know, you can see that the, the LED on the side, the ammo light has depleted, the green has turned red. Um, so we'll use that as sort of indicators and things like that as well. And we don't necessarily do that stuff in ZBrush, but we'll put the call outs there for where the light goes or where the LEDs go and things like that. Hey, Michael, uh, I got a uh, question for you. Yeah, oh, by all means, uh, I should have started with this. If you all have any questions midway through, feel free to interrupt me, because otherwise I'll just ramble on here for, like, hours. <laughs> so, yeah, feel free. All right, so when you're doing the stuff in ZBrush here, do you guys think about the shaders that are going to be applied later? Because in Destiny, you can collect shaders and have them applied. Yeah, kind of yes and kind of no. Um, for, for, like, that PvE weapon set, the one that has the big white open canvas on it, this guy, we think about the shaders in that the player is going to be able to customize the weapons by putting their own shaders onto the thing. So 
uh, in this case, we thought about it in the regards of leave the big open white canvas so when a shader goes onto it, you have a big swatch of color or a big swatch of camouflage or, or something like that that reads um, very identifiable when you put the shader on there. Uh, but as far as um, like whether or not it's going to be blue or green or anything like that, uh, not really unless it's an exotic weapon. Um, since the exotics are the ones that we give you, like here's a prepackaged version of the gun, this is what it looks like, you can't do anything to it custom, then we think about the shaders more as far as the materials and the metals and stuff go. But as far as um, the, the low level, the whites, the blue, the green, even the purple weapons, we don't think about it too, too much. At least I don't. I can't speak for everybody else. I got another one. From for you too. That's online. Uh, yeah. They're asking, what's your average time frame for completing one of these in the production environment? Ooh, uh, this one might get me in trouble. Um, so it, it obviously it depends on the weapon. The more ornate the weapon, the longer it's going to take you. Uh, physically, the larger the weapon, the longer it's going to take you. Um, I generally spend anywhere between three and four weeks, start to finish, on a gun, um, and it. How the time gets broken down uh, sort of depends on kind of how the concept comes into us. In a case like uh, this sidearm, the hand cannon here, because the concept block model that came into us was, was kind of a chunky, uh, low resolution basic block model, the first iteration of the block model that we have to do is fairly quick because you're just building out basic shapes and basic forms with primitives, sending that over to the game, getting that approved within a day or so, and then moving back on to um, the high poly modeling side of things. On some of the other ones where we'll get um, like a really, really flushed out, um, full detailed block model, like uh, one of the artists at the studio named Dima, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce his last name because I'll butcher that. Um, but he, he likes to model like everything. He'll put all the springs, he's like me, but he does it in a different software. I think he uses Modo. Um, but he'll model everything and then give it to us. But the topology is not good. Um, it's, it's open edges, triangulation, it's end gons, it's meh. Um, so in a case like that, we'll actually spend more time doing the cleanup on the block model that we get from them. Um, before that gets kicked off to Max and ZBrush. So uh, really chunky, low poly block model. We'll take a day or two to do a, a model of it and then get that into ZBrush within maybe two days tops. Um, on like one of the, the DEMA models, the high end models, that might take a week to clean up just because there's so much information that we have to do. But then when you kick that over to ZBrush, it's really a matter of like poly group by angles, divide, divide, dynamesh, polish, done, right? It, it takes like half a day to do a high poly on a gun like that. Um, so in one case, it's you know, two days of low, five days of high. In one, the other case, it's five days of low, a day of high. You know, it sort of fluctuates back and forth. But generally, it's three to four weeks total. Sorry, that was sort of rambly, wasn't it? Oh, oh there's a Louis. T-shirt. Yeah, it's me. It's me, Louis. I switched <laughs> it up there with Drust. Secret business. OK, uh, Spiro. Uh, hey, didn't we have class together a minute ago? Uh, I was wondering if you could go through your process on making the uh, ornate filigree. It's very uh, clean and well done, and yeah, you absolutely. also have to iterate on that. So I was wondering if you could go more in depth. On yeah, that. absolutely. I was actually meant to cover that, and I'm sorry that I did not. Um, the best laid plans of mice and men, and I completely spaced on it. Uh, so I will just pick a nice empty spot back here. Um, so uh, the way I do filigree, and I'll do it with the layer system just so um, you can sort of see how I did it, uh, future-proofing it in case. Um, but what I'll do, and uh, this is a nice low 6.3 million active points. Um, so let me go ahead and get rid of those parts. See, now it's only 2.5 million. It's not bad. Let me turn on line. There you go. Yeah, you can't see anything, can you? Um, so there's a bunch of different ways that I'll go about doing filigree, and it just sort of depends on, on how. Um, but in this case, what I did is I used the um, masking brush, uh, Lazy Mouse, and um, let's do this here.
do a nice fancy little border for you there. We'll go through here. Go ahead and turn up my intensity so it's not quite so soft. Okay, so yeah, I'll go in there and I'll really roughly um, lay it out as far as the the shape and the flow and stuff like that. And I actually watched a lot of YouTube videos on like the old masters, how they were doing this stuff. Um, and I gotta say, if you ever want to feel like you're not talented at all, watch these guys. <laughs> like they've got a magnifying glass that's the size of a basketball, and they're looking through this thing and they're working with stuff that's. It's, it's microscopic, it feels like, and the, the steady hands that those guys have are just bonkers. Um, so we'll go through here and do some of this sort of stuff, and I'll just do a really quick example of this. Okay, so there's my masterpiece. Um, and the other thing that you can do too, and this is something that I actually learned from a former colleague of mine, uh, if you've got a mask that you've drawn out and you've got, so like if you look down in here, there's a little bit of garbage and there's some garbage over here and some garbage down there. Um, if you ever have that sort of thing, what you can do is uh, with your masking selected, click on the mesh a couple of times, blur it, invert your mask, click on it a couple of times, blur it back out, invert. No, I've gone the wrong way, too far. You can do this a couple of different times. And what it'll do, I've obviously destroyed it, so this is a terrible example. Uh, but what you can see down here is now uh, it's, it's sort of blurred and sharpened and blurred and sharpened enough times that it sort of refines those edges. And if you're going for something that's like soft and ornate, uh, you can actually go through and pretty nastily go in there and block the stuff out and then refine it with softening and sharpening of your brush a few different times. Um, so let me go ahead and clean this back up again. And this also works really well too. Um, look, so we'll grab this corner here. Um, my, I don't have the steadiest of hands when it comes to this sort of stuff. So, and, and I'm pretty picky about like having nice radius edges on things. So if you've got a mask that has like sharp 90 degree corners, blur it, invert, blur it, sharpen it, and now you've got a fillet on every single corner, and that fillet is the exact same all the way around. So I use that quite a bit as well. So let me go ahead That's and pretty cool. undo all that. Um, okay, so uh, let's say we're happy with this. Everybody's, everybody's content with the modeling on that thing for some reason. Um, what I'll do is I will just polygroup that, just so I have um, something there, and then See if I was smart enough to load this. I was not. Uh, so if you go in, no, go away. Uh, if you go into your, your default brushes, go to the smooth folder. And I should point out that this brush that I'm about to show you is the one that got me in trouble last time I was here. Um, opened my mouth and put my foot into it, so I'm not going to do it this time. Uh, smooth groups uh, is one of the best brushes out there. Very well documented. Um, but if you have smooth groups selected, and we'll zoom in here real nice and close. And I should point out, the reason that I'm using smooth groups instead of like adding a border around it is because as soon as you modify the geometry by adding extra resolution to it, you can't use a layer to turn that off and on. So a layer has to work with the same geometry that was there in the layer, so you can't, um, yeah, what am I trying to say? You can't add geometry, you can't remove geometry if you're gonna use the layer, so, you know, I use this because that gets around that. But if you zoom in really close, way closer than you're supposed to, with smooth groups on there, if I paint over that group edge, yeah, that's the same reaction I got last time. <laughs> But you can go in there and you can really easily clean up, clean that stuff up. And you can go over some of these different areas like, and, and just super fast. Yeah, it's give. a nice manual Polish right there. It's Polish with a capital P. <laughs> 
um, and it'll give you a really nice clean, clean poly group around there. Um, even so much so that you can go over edges a couple different times and sort of basically flatten, flatten some of these high spots and stuff out. Um, so I'll use the smooth groups brush, go around, clean all that stuff up. Um, and then what I will do is, um, actually let me go ahead and turn on a layer here so you can see exactly how this is going to work. Um, after you've gone through and you've used smooth groups to clean up all your group borders, I will isolate. Mask, and I know there's faster ways of doing this now, but I have muscle memory, so uh, it's really hard for me to break habits, even though I know just like Control, Shift, Alt, Click with the transpose will isolate the, it, yeah. We'll talk to you about this off camera. <laughs> um, so with this selected, I can go ahead and just transpose that out. And then isolate that again. Uh, and then the ZBrush hotkey for, for growing and exposed isolation is Control, Shift, X. Do that twice, isolate just that border edge around it, and then control W to polygroup that. Actually, let me pick a better polygroup color. Come on, give me something that's visible. There we go. Um, and that'll give you uh, a, a step border. And then if you want to, you can go through again and uh, clean that up. And what you'll have is a really nice, crisp, sharp border for that filigree. And then if we turn off our layering here, it goes away. But you've kept your polygroups. So you can go through there and do your, your pattern, um, extract it out, get it nice and clean, clean up your borders. And then if for some reason uh, art direction or a lead comes in and says, hey, yeah, I like that, but let's you know, do a different pattern. Uh, it's really easy to just turn off that layer, go in there, do it again, mask it, group it, transpose it out, do your smooth, and then you can just completely change that up again. As, and as a matter of fact, I might have, um, if I go back over to this piece here, no, I don't have the original polygroups on it. I was thinking for some reason I might have had the original uh, polygroups on there. Nope, go away. Come on. All right, well, you're just going to have to trust me on that one. Um, there we go. Yes, yes, yes. OK, yeah, it doesn't look like I kept any, kept any of the original polygroups. But yeah, then you're not actually modifying or adding or removing topology. You're just working with what's already there. So anyway, that was a long-winded way of saying just like that. That's how I do it. That's great. We got another question here in the yeah a round of applause. Absolutely, way to go. Oh, hey, sorry about that. Yeah, it's really great. Hey, so uh, way in the back here, I just want to commend the people back here. It smells really fruity. It's like a perfume, so it's nice to be here. Uh, what's your name? Hey, Carlos. Nice to see you. Where are you from? San Francisco. Okay, perfect. Go ahead and ask a question. Hi, man. So. I was, I was just wondering, because you said it, uh, it takes about three weeks to finish. Yep. Uh, I was just wondering if you do the whole process, like the texturing and the baking and the UVs. And yep. basically yeah, sure do. So each, each artist is basically assigned their own weapon. Um, and then that person will take it from start to finish. I mean, they'll get the concept. Uh, in some cases, they'll work back and forth with the concept artist to refine some ideas and the art directors but they'll take that from the conceptual phase all the way through the low poly and the texturing and the shader assignments and the hookup in the game and the whole nine yards. So that three to four weeks covers everything start to finish. Very nice, thank you. We got another one here, row number three. What's your name? I'm Norm. Hey Norm, nice to see you. Hey. First time? No, we've seen each other before. Go ahead. Uh, just a question on the poly, when you you say you don't affect the poly group when you're doing that layer. Mm -hmm. So when you when you turn off that layer, you still retain your original. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, nuts. You're you're controlling. You can control the grouping and the the position and the placement of the polygons while using a layer, but you can't add or remove polygons with a layer. So by simply turning that layer off, you're actually reverting back to the meshes physical uh, location in space before the modification, but all the, the grouping and, and the information that you added to it as far as polygroups goes <laughs> stays. 
So you're, you're technically not modifying the mesh or the vert order or the number of verts in any way. You're just moving stuff, which is kind of handy, right? OK. I'm way in the back with the people now. Yeah, yeah. What's your name? Thomas. Uh, uh, well, I'm from Texas, but uh, I'm a Nomen student. Um, I was wondering, you said it's four weeks for an asset. Are mm -hmm. you working on just one asset at a time, or do you work on multiple? Ooh, that's it, a tricky is that question. A part of four weeks? Uh, it's it's going to be four weeks or so per asset, but you're not always necessarily working on one asset at a time. Um, there are instances in game development where you get to a certain point and you can't progress any further because you're waiting on feedback from somebody or direction from somebody. Um, so instead of just sitting there idle for a day, two, three while you wait on something, um, oftentimes we'll have either a backlog of other stuff to work on. Um, I always have bugs to fix. I break stuff left and right. So if I ever get into one of those situations, I'll just roll back and fix some bugs. But um, in a lot of cases, you'll have two or three guns that you might be working on or that are assigned to you at any given point. So if you get stuck on one of them, you can roll back onto another one, start that process. So you might ping pong back and forth between two or three different things. But the four weeks is just for one gun's completion. Excuse me. And I should point out, too, that in, in my ideal world, we don't always get this. But in my ideal world, uh, each artist is going to get not just a single weapon in a weapon family, but they're going to get an entire suite of weapons. So in this case, an exotic is an exotic weapon, right? There's one of them. But if you're working on, on something like this, which is the PVE weapon set, it's an entire suite. So there's a hand cannon, there's a sidearm, there's an SMG, there's a grenade launcher, there's an assault rifle. There's like seven or eight different weapons. Um, Ultimately, one person should be responsible for all of those because each, each one of those pieces is supposed to fit within a stylistic universe. And in my personal opinion, the best way to match style from one gun to another is just to have the same person do the other six, right? It's, it's a lot more difficult for me to give you a weapon and say, match my style, or for you to give me a weapon and make me match yours. So, you know. If you do have five or six of them assigned to you at any given time, then you can just go back and forth between any of those when you get stuck. That's a great response. There's, a, there's an online question here. Yeah. And they're asking, inside of that uh, period of production, do you ever have time to implement Easter eggs or secrets into your creations? Perhaps that would be a time when you might mess around in that regard. Uh, so Bungie has a really strict policy okay. about Easter eggs. Strike um, that from the record. Yeah, we I condone that kind of behavior. Um, no Easter eggs. An, an, an individual who shall remain nameless. Uh, oh, don't do that. No naming names. Actually, uh, I think it was on Halo 1, um, or it might have been Halo 2. There was a, an editor for the game that went out with the PC copy of it. And um, at the studio, an error, an assert that you would pop up was called an ass error. It was an assert. Um, so somebody, in their infinite wisdom, shall remain nameless, uh, took a photo of their ass and then put that into the game that when you got the ass error, up came, up came said ass. Yeah, so it turns out that got pressed to disk and sent out on a truck. <laughs> Don't do it. Um, and there was a big kerfuffle and the trucks had to be recalled and the Easter egg had to be removed, and the disks had to be pressed again, and it cost millions of dollars. Ah, long sigh. So, yeah, there's, there's a pretty strict policy about doing stuff like that, so... Um, no, no, we don't put Easter eggs in anything. Gone not the not unless they're the, approved. Yeah, gone are the days of the old NBA jam. <laughs> yep, okay. yep, none of that. We will have Anyone none of that. that. I think I might just dated myself. Any, oh, look at this in the front row. Very courageous. What's your name? Deanna in the spit row, as they call it. Nice. How, thanks. How often do you find yourself creating new custom like 2D alphas, insert multi meshes, brushes, those sorts of things to reuse later or share with your team? Or do you use ZBrush standard most of the time? Fairly often. Um, I'm trying to get a better culture at the studio of sharing assets from, from artist to artist. 
Um, but because each weapon is usually so bespoke, it's so custom made from the concept all the way through the final asset, there's a lot of times, unless it's all within the same family of weapon, like all these PVE guns, there's not a lot of times that you share assets from one gun to another. You know, maybe a small bobble, like a laser or a light or something like that. Um, but for the most part, everything is pretty custom and bespoke. So we don't often share assets from gun to gun, um, but as far as alphas and insert meshes, br uh, insert brushes go, um, I tend to make uh, quite a few of them. Uh, I didn't bring any of them with me, uh, but I have a, a fastener's brush that's uh, hex head screws, flat head screws, rivets, uh, flat rivets, domed rivets, the backs of rivets, threaded studs, nuts, washers, crush washers, uh, basically any sort of, like if you go to the hardware store at Ace or Home Depot and you walk down that aisle, like that's like a candy aisle for me. I'll just pick one of this and one of that and I'll go home and make them. Um, but one of the things that I find uh, super useful when you're making families of things is using that same kind of level of micro detail across the entire suite. So like all the PVE weapons, when you look at them, they all use hex head screws. All the Tex Mechanica stuff, except for that one spot where I found out that I just messed up, uh, uses flathead screws. Um, you know, maybe all the vice stuff uses like a three-headed locking screw. So like for stuff like that, I'll make insert brushes just to make it easier for that. Um, and then alphas, I have a library of alphas that's nuts, like scroll work and um, holes and, and roll pins. And like, you know, I, I use alphas for just about everything, so I make quite a few of them, yeah. Um, actually, alpha, here's a good example of an alpha. Uh, so yeah, this, um, ooh, that's a giant brush. Uh, so like this hex pattern that's on the grip of this uh, hand cannon, that was done with an alpha using um, noisemaker and UVs. So um, what I did on this one is I modeled it out, I did my panel line. As a matter of fact, I think, let me see here. Go to this piece right here. Yeah, so uh, I would model the piece out standalone. Um, and was I smart enough to put layers on this thing? Yay, I have layers. Wait, no, that's not right. I thought that, what are you? Oh, that's just, I guess I duplicated a layer, okay. Um, so I modeled the piece, um, no information on it whatsoever, and I wanted that, you know, uh, the hex pattern to sort of tile around it nice and uniform-like. Um, get it, so ZBrush has a really nice UV unwrapping app for, for things like organics and stuff like that. Um, but I'm, I'm not as bad as some of the other people that I've worked with, but I like unwraps to be like dead straight up and down or perfectly horizontal or split right down the middle. I'm, I'm pretty particular about that stuff, especially if I'm using noise to lay over a surface, especially a geometric noise like this. So what I did on this one here is uh, like I duplicate the mesh, um, come down to Z remesh. Uh, I'm gonna talk through this one instead of actually doing it just because this might take a second. Um, at four and a half million points, if I tried to Z remesh this, it might take a few minutes. Um, but I'll Z remesh it. I'll get a basic version of that mesh um, duplicated out, you know, five, 10,000 poly, something that I can send over to UV layout or Max or Maya. I'll lay out the UVs on that thing nice and straight up and down, and then send that back to ZBrush. And then uh, with those two subtools selected, the UV laid out version and the original high poly version, I'll duplicate and then uh, or divide and project, divide, project, divide, project until I get all the original information projected onto the, the now subdivided low poly version of it with UVs. And then once I have that done, I'll go to Noisemaker apply that noise pattern, set the tiling on it, and then carry on. That way I get a nice even pattern all the way around. Um, and I do stuff like that on, um, I used it on this, this inset piece here. I also used it on uh, this panel that runs up and down here. Uh, although on this panel that runs up and down, it's just a flat plane, so that was really easy. I just projected that straight onto the side and didn't even, didn't even mess with it. Um, so yeah, super handy for, for that sort of stuff, and alphas will, make life a lot easier for that. All right. Um, 
So yeah, this is the high poly for that hand cannon that we were looking at the concept for. Um, and then, <laughs> there you go. Here's another one of those insane examples of um, plastic mold lines. So um, injection molding points on the bottom of it, a plastic mold line that runs down the center of the grip, um, you know, manufacturing stamping on the bottom of it. Um, VG standing for Vanguard, which had to come out, by the way. That would technically classify as an Easter egg. That's gone. Um, until now, y'all didn't just see that. We have one more here in the front row. It's a repeat offender. <laughs> Wearing a ZBrush hat, so it's acceptable. You had mentioned earlier about beveling. What's uh -huh. your favorite way to bevel your curved edges? OK, so there are a handful of different ways that I go about doing it. Uh, the most brute force way is to just use the clip curve and then work your way around all the different shapes until you get something. Um, oh, no, nope, no, nope, stop making noise. Um, so, like in a case like this, if I wanted to increase the angle of that bevel, uh, let me make sure I've got local symmetry turned on. Make sure I find the right symmetrical axis. Where are you? There we are. Okay. So we've got what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, so in a case like this, I would go through there, clip curve. Come on, go away. Go ahead and clip that just to give that um, the, the deeper angle on the bevel. And then we wait in awkward silence. And we wait, there it is, okay. Uh, and so now you've got a nice flat plane, but you've got a nice, uh, well, a not so nice uh, 90 degree edge there in the middle. Um, I'll use hard polish. And then turn down my intensity so this doesn't destroy the mesh. And I'll just go in there and just real gently polish that back to a radius. So that's super handy for like outside corners, um, but inside corners, it eh, doesn't work so well for. Um, and for that, well, okay, so let me go ahead and undo all of that. Okay, so um, radius shapes, radial symmetry is, is the, the trick to that one. Uh, so on this inside edge here, if you wanted to round that out, I'll hit it, well, not with smooth groups. Let me go back to smooth. So I'll hit it with a smooth brush um, with radial symmetry turned on, and then with H polish again, just eyeball on that 45 degree, oh, let me turn up my intensity a little bit here. Uh, just eyeball it somewhere on that 45 degree angle. And that'll give you a nice, nice bevel on an inside radius. Um, so that's great for round surfaces. Um, if you have, if you've thought about it ahead of time, which I often don't do, um, while you're still in the low poly blockout phase, you can do your bevels then with Z Modeler, um, which is the easier way to do it. Like I said, I tend to brute force things, so I'll take something up to six million points, and then I'll try to figure out how to bevel it. Um, because I'm smart like that. Um, so you can do things like that. If you've got, let me take a look here at, ah, this is a good example. Uh, so if you wanted to put like a radius on, on this inside edge here, right, there'd be kind of a, it'd be kind of a pain in the butt, right? You can't go in there and, and polish that so well. Um, although, I mean, if you, so you know if you hold down the alt function, it goes from pushing in to pulling out or from pulling out to pushing in. So with H polish, you can do the same thing. And you can go in there and, and sort of bump that information out. Um, so if you're really careful and you're not so worried about the detail, you can go in there and add a bevel to the inside, although uh, that's generally not uber precise for me. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm pretty particular about some of this sort of stuff. So the other thing that you can do too is isolate it. And let me see here. Okay, that's not a poly group. 
um, if you isolate it and then flip the faces, what, so this is easier to see than it is to explain, what was the outside of a face is now the inside of a face, and that inside corner that I couldn't bevel before is now an outside corner. So if I look at it from the inside, I can now smooth that, turn on hard polish, and if I crank up my intensity a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. And then flip my faces back again. I can do an inside bevel on a surface just by hand. Um, it's not perfect. The longer the arc of the curve, the more warble and wobble and stuff that you're going to have to get in there and clean up. Uh, but it's, for, for the most part, it's a pretty easy way of doing an inside bevel like that. Um, I should warn you, though, if you're going to do that, sir, if you're going to do that trick, if you've got part of your mesh isolated and then you unhide everything, um, you've got half your model inside out and half your model outside in, so just make sure you keep track of which side is supposed to be out, which side is supposed to be in. Um, I've, I've hosed myself a couple of times doing that, because then you're trying to figure out, you're trying to manually grab faces and go back, and it's, it's a pain. Um, so that's a, that's a handy one for doing inside bevels. And then for doing um, stuff like, I don't know, let's just do this here real quick, I'll show you. Um, we're going to isolate this, we're going to split that out, we're going to go to this guy here, we're going to close some holes just so I have a small mesh to work with so it doesn't kill the machine. And then we're going to cap that, because that needs to be perfect for some reason. Um, so like if I wanted to do an inside radius on a surface, and this is, this, so part of my technique that I use is thinking large and then carving into it, kind of like you're carving a sculpture out of stone or something, right? You start with a giant block of stone and you whittle the David out of it, not to compare any of this garbage to Michelangelo, but you know, you're whittling into the shape that you're trying to get. Um, so in a case like something like this, what I would do is, if we use clip circle, um, the alt function of clip circle to do that, and that'll clip a hole into it, and then I'm just gonna go ahead and dynam, no, no, that's terrible. Go undo. Dynamesh that. Do, do, do. Okay, so now we have a two million polygon dynamesh there. I'm going to redo that clip to get rid of some of that junk that was put in there. And now we have more junk. Let's undo that again. There we go. That's better. So now I have that, that inside radius that I'm going to want, that nice inside fillet. And then this is where I get old school with the transpose master, or the transpose line. I'll mask this section here, invert my mask, and then zoom in stupid close on stuff, because why not? Um, and then with the transpose line, uh, just drag that out. And I usually use the mouse for this, because uh, wobbly hands and imprecise clicking and stuff. But from if you zoom in far enough, you can actually see where the, the tessellation of the mess goes from stepping in to flattening off, and then it starts to step back out again. So it's like the, the pixel line. Um, right. Oh, no. So there's a step in a polyface right there. Here's a step. Here's a couple of steps that come down here. But if you zoom in far enough, you can actually see where that stepping starts. And if you click on uh, the transpose line on one of those flat faces right there, and then just single click on that red circle on the inside of it where the XY is, and zoom out, it will actually give you like a perfect flat to fillet transition. Um, so if you, if you think about it far enough in advance, you can do that sort of stuff as well. And then click. And now you have a nice clean, even inside fillet that you can, you can work with. Um, and then in a case like this, you might have a little bit of garbage on there. You can go in there and just hit that with a smooth, and that's gone. Or Dynamesh it one more time, and then it'll go away as well. So, OK. 
Okay. Okay, here. And then, oh, good Lord, we've only got like 15 minutes left. We um, go back, by the way, there's some seats right here. Oh, God, would you so quit you know. changing people? What? Quit changing people. You were Drust, and then you were Tucci, now you're Paul. Keep you on your toes. God. You didn't see me walk in front of you? No, I did not. Ah, I was, I was completely well. focused on filleting stuff. Um, okay, so we've only got a couple minutes left here. Um, I guess the last weapon that I want to show you guys, um, I'm sure some of you have seen this one before. Uh, it's been fairly popular. It's the Rat King. Uh, this was one of my more recent weapons. This was, this was done right before um, we moved off of uh, D2, Destiny 2. Um, this is easily one of the silliest weapons that I've ever made, and I mean that in the best possible way. Um, I had an art director come to me and say, hey, I want you to make a gun. Okay, I can do that. This is what I do every day. That has a samurai uh, sword handle. Okay, that's a little bit different. That's different. That lights up. Okay, I can do that. Made out of rats. What? <laughs> All right, done. You got it. You want a gun made out of rats? I can make a gun out of rats. Um, so this was, the, this was the early concept for it. Um, it has changed a little bit since this, but not by a whole lot. The main, the main differences that I had to go through were, was to simplify the slides so the rats read better in first person. Um, in the game, the, the field of view, the perspective of first person with the weapons is, is pretty harsh. It's a sharp angle. So if you take uh, five, six rats and stack them up on top of each other and then run them down the length of a gun, I mean, one, you're looking at six rat butts. <laughs> Who wants to look at six rat butts? Uh, but two, uh, because they end up getting smaller and smaller, you sort of lose all the fidelity and the detail. So I simplified it a little bit and ended up going with, no, not that one, not that one. And see right here, this, okay, so this is why you make that little icon that goes at the top of your screen. Because I'm looking at these icons up here and I didn't do it for these. And Rat King is like this little block that says 17 next to it. And so you click on that guy there. Make your lives easier. Name your layers and then flatten them to the top. Okay. So. This ended up being the final version of the Rat King um, as it ended up in game. Um, and this one was just silly fun, right? So I'm a hard surface guy. Uh, you want a strut or a machined part or a gun receiver or a scope, I'm your man. You want me to make a mouse? Uh, that's a challenge. Um, so this one was challenging in all sorts of different ways. So uh, it started with a basic rat model. Um, which I wasn't prepared enough to bring with me, and a basic rat skull. And these were all blocked out in 3D Studio Max and then brought over here and detailed out. Um, like I said, I'm not a, a character guy, so I mean, these guys could probably, pff, ah, rats, no problem. I can get in here five minutes later, you know, Damien has cranked out a rat, and you're like, oh, well, God. Um, so uh, for me, it was, I mean, it was a fun challenge, but it was a challenge nonetheless. Um, so what I did is I knew I wanted to do the rats. I knew I needed three of them um, because when they said rats, the first thing that came to mind was the three blind mice. Um, so I was like, ah, you know, that's inspiration. I'll, I'll run with that. Um, so I ended up with the three blind mice. Um, well, they're not really blind. They're just, you know, it's whatever. Um, so there's three of them. I started with a rat in just like a neutral standing pose and then uh, use Transpose Master, or not Transpose Master, but the Transpose tool um, and masking and just like sort of bent them all up and got them into the three different positions. Uh, and the idea on this one was that it was sort of a, um, like a, a, an old freeze, right? So you've got like a sequence of events happening down the length of a single sculpture. So the rat goes from a menacing sitting position, takes off on his back legs, and then hits full stride before it runs out the end of the barrel. It, it, kind of silly, but it was fun. Um, so it's supposed to be the same rat all three times down the length of the thing. So I just basically repose the same rat over and over again. Um, and then as I was working on it, I was like, well, it's three blind mice. I don't know, I, I seem to remember something about cheese and mice and cheese and mice chasing after cheese and all that sort of stuff. I was like, well, okay, so wouldn't it be fun to put something with cheese in this thing? So, and this isn't an Easter egg, so I'm not gonna get in trouble for this one. <laughs> it's just the front sight. 
So it turns out the front side is made out of Swiss cheese. Um, so, you know, I was actually, we did a, um, uh, I don't know who it was, it was Impact Props, or somebody, somebody did a, a prop version of this weapon for us, where they took my 3D file, printed it out, made a, a physical replica of it, and then we used it for our live action commercials uh, for Destiny 2. And um, unfortunately, it didn't end up working out for today, but I had gotten a hold of the guy and I said, hey, can you send me, uh, like make me a copy of the Rat King? One, because I want it, because that's awesome. Um, and two, because like, it'd be really cool to have a copy of the Rat King sitting here for you guys to see and you know, get your hands on and stuff. And he said, yeah, I can, I can do that. And I, I explained to him what I was doing. I was coming down here and I was talking to you guys about ZBrush and, and how I made guns for Destiny. And he said, wait a minute, are you the artist? Are you the guy that made the Rat King? I said, yeah. He said, man, I got to tell you. He said, that's the funniest damn thing I've ever seen. He said, I'm printing this thing out. And I'm like, there's a block of cheese for the front sight. <laughs> He's like, that's friggin' hilarious. He's like, nobody has noticed that. And I said, I haven't seen anything on it. So um, I figured I'd let the, the cat out of the bag, no pun intended, um, and uh, show you guys that just in case. Because I thought it was funny. And you know, I don't care what everybody else thinks. I think it's hilarious. Um, and then, oh, and then again, silly detail. There's rifling inside the barrel. Why? Because I can. Why not? Um, and then, uh, anyway, funny stories aside, uh, and then there was the rat skull. The rat skull was probably the most challenging part of this thing, just because it's a friggin' rat skull. I mean, I've, I've never modeled anything quite like this before. So, um, you know, and this was a fun one too, because I went in there and I did a bunch of research on rats. I probably know more about rats and rat skull anatomy and the different types of rats than there are, yeah, I, I, nobody should know that much information unless you study rats for a living. Um, but it was fun to go in there and do like the, the skull plate separations and the different parts and the teeth and um, you know, adding the little microscopic sort of like bone pore grain to things and um, you know, I, I probably went further with it. I, like I said, I go further with things than I'm supposed to, but you know, it's kind of fun to go in there and like if I, hi no, 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 oh, it helps if I'm on the right tool. But if I go in there and hide some of this stuff, So, I mean, why? I don't know. <laughs> because, right? So, you know, I'll go, I went in there and I did all the cavity inside the skull and, and all that sort of stuff. And I actually modeled, like, I was going to have to remodel this thing in low poly in order to do it, but I was running low on time, so I just used uh, Z remesher and then auto topology or auto mesh reduction in Max. It's the nastiest mesh I've ever shipped in a game, but it works. So let me back out of that guy there. Um, yeah, I, I mean, more or less, it was just that. I mean, this was, this was just one of those ones that was like, it was silly, it was fun, and uh, it was easily one of the most challenging things that I've ever done as far as hard surface goes, because, you know, it's mostly not hard surface, it's rats. Um, but yeah, it was fun, nonetheless. Any other questions? Oh, we got some, some. Right here. Some. I got some dead time to fill. Here we go. Got a question right here. Uh, for the right plane inside the barrel, are yeah. you creating that first as uh, using other techniques completely straight as a separate subtool? I do. I do, actually. That's, that's exactly how I do it. So um, what I will do is I will start with a box. I will make polymesh 3D out of this guy. I will Q cube it. Let me turn on my line since that's actually useful now. I'll go ahead and stretch that guy out there a little bit. Insert multi mesh, uh, multiple edges. Go ahead and insert a bunch of edges in there. Um, just so I have some twisting ability for it. And then I can do um, a ray mesh, transpose. Come on, get out the way. Move that guy down here. We're going to go ahead and do repeat. 
rotate. No, wrong button. We'll go ahead and change that to 360. Lower, uh, five, five sounds like a good number. Okay, so now you've got five just straight, straight shot rifling channels. Um, go ahead and make that into a mesh. And then I will generally use, and I'm sure there's like 500 billion different ways to do this, like there is everything else in ZBrush. Twist. No, is that the right? No, that's not the right one. No, nope, not that one. There, no, wow. Ah. All right, so you're going to have to trust me on this one. Um, get back down there. So I'll basically do something like that. Unify it, just unify it. You're not unify. at the center of the world, so it's the deformer's twist oh. is the center of the world. Well, thanks for telling me that now, Paul. We make it All right, look like there a you go. Now twist. There, see, see, Paul knows a little bit of something about ZBrush. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. So yeah, I would do that basically, and then uh, normally I would just hit S pivot, send it off to the center of the world, twist it, and then put it back where it belongs. Um, Unify works too. Um, and then I would just use that as a dynamesh to to cut out of the inside of the barrel. You got another question all the way in the back. So being a hard surface guy, are you super excited about live booleans? I was just surprised not to see any in your uh, tutorials. Uh, I am, yes. But um, I mentioned a little bit earlier that I am I'm like an old man. Like I'm a pre prematurely old man. Don't, I'm not old. Don't, don't anybody think that I'm old. Um, but like I get set into a certain way of doing things. And I get used to that way. And it takes me a little while to break out of that. So I did do some of the, the early testing for the live Booleans. And I was able to use it quite a bit. And it, it's super awesome and super powerful. Uh, but for all the stuff that I did on uh, Destiny 2, it was all happening before live Booleans hit the floor. So I didn't actually have a chance to implement the live Boolean system into production workflow. I've just had a chance to mess with a little bit at home on my own time. Uh, but now, as we've started moving on into future projects, I am using it more and more at work. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm slowly adapting to it, but it's like the transpose line for me. Like, I'm used to using the transpose line, and as awesome as that gizmo is, like, mm, I don't know, I still want to hit Y and go back to that transpose line. So, I'm, I'm adapting slowly but surely. Anything? Any other questions out there? Oh, here I come. Here I come. Coming right now. So you were talking about editing UVs with UV Master mm -hmm. and being kind of uh, particular about how you set up your UVs. Yes. Do you use the transpose tool in any special way to achieve that when you're editing uh, UVs that UV Master spits out? Um. Because I don't use the UV Master too, too much, uh, and anything that I do use with UV Master, it's not the, when I use UV uh, Master to lay out UVs in, in ZBrush, I don't necessarily need them to be perfectly perpendicular or horizontal for anything. So I just need it for a uniform noise pattern. Um, in that case, I don't really mess with the layout of the UVs or anything. I just automatically go, fingers crossed, don't crash, don't crash, don't crash, yay, it worked apply noise, done. Um, in a case like that hex pattern where I needed, I really needed it to be dead nuts, like straight up and down. Um, in that case, that, then you probably could do it with UV uh, master and then go to the flat mode and then rotate it around and then get it lined up and send it back over there. Um, but I usually just, like I said, I kick it back to another 3D app and then make sure that it's dead straight and then do it from there. Cool, does that help? Or answer the question? Perfect. Any other questions out there? What? Bueller? Okay, here we go. Dufresne? Andy? Dufresne? Here we go. Here we go. Another question right here. Where was the arm? Here it is. By the way, UV Master has a polygon count limit, just so you all know that. I can't remember the exact number, but about 100,000 polygons. It won't work after about, I think it's 110 if I remember right. 
100,000, that's what I use for like screw heads. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> You're pushing it. I, uh, I love that you guys sculpt the patterns in the high res. Yeah. Has there been any temptation to do that in Painter? It seems to be kind of a trend. <sighs> yeah, some people do. Um, the, the Sunshot, the one that uh, Josh Morrison worked on, uh, I think that's the main reason that he did the, the line work and the pattern work in Painter. Um, because there's always the possibility of uh, direction coming back in and saying, hey, let's change up that line work, let's do a new variant of it that doesn't have that line work in it. Um, let's make it go out instead of in, you know, whatever reason that they have that they want to change it. Doing it in a third-party app like Painter does have its advantages in that it can be just a layer that you turn off and then paint again. Um, but personally, I find that I can get that same level of flexibility in ZBrush with the layer system. Um, and if I really wanted to, I could just do the same thing, you know, put that on a layer like I did with the Prospector Filigree, turn it off, turn it back on again. Um, and, you know, as far as I can tell, it's, unless you're taking materialing and texturing and stuff into account at the same time as you're doing the, the detail work and the plastic grains and the filigree and things like that, um, which if I was smart, I'd probably poly paint this stuff as I'm sculpting it, but mm, um, not so bright. Uh, because I just do the filigree work and then I figure out how to texture it later on. Um, you know, honestly, I find that just doing it with layers is, is as efficient as doing it in another program. All right, unfortunately, we've got to move on. So ladies and gentlemen, Michael Klein, give him a round of applause.